to staying the course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised Word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. I love your Word. I love the way. Good morning. Last week, who remembers the message? Okay, you guys are all forgetting the messages. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. We talked about that we need to be a people that are resilient in our faith, that we need to stand firm. The class Pastor Chris is going to teach in the fall is really all about that. It's how to develop personal resilience, to stand for truth in the midst of a culture that is abandoning the ethics and morals of the Word of God. Uh, We need to be people that are brave, people that truly are people of courage. And I know a lot of people are getting awards for courage, but I don't call that courage at all. I added one point. Pam's going to make up a handout for all of us. But when I lack peace and strength and joy in my life, I have this six-point litmus test, but I added one. So we're going to go over it because a lot, of, a lot of people are saying, what were those six points again? And now there's seven. It's God's number. I'm just saying it's, it's better to have seven. <laughs> yes. So uh, am I on the path? That's the first one. It's really the seven Ps. You got to ask yourself, Are you on the narrow path that leads to life or are you on the wide path that leads to destruction? And folks, I got to tell you, you're either on one path or the other. You can't be on both at the same time. The second question is, am I praying? Am I a man or woman of prayer? Am I running to the Lord in prayer? You know, the Bible, it's very clear. It says, pray when? Always, without ceasing, in all things, give thanks to God. Be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer, everything by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that transcends understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but I need to remind myself of that. Because so often I get so busy and caught up in the things of life that I'll start my day in prayer, and the next thing I know, I'm laying my head on my pillow, and all I did was pray for my meals the whole day. I didn't walk with God. We need to be people of prayer. So am I on the path? Am I praying? The third one is, am I praising? Are you worshiping God? And not just corporately. And corporate worship is awesome. I got to tell you, I feel the Holy Spirit most of the time when we worship together. But man, we need to be worshiping the Lord in our daily lives, in our prayer closets. We need to be praising God and worshiping God. When good things happen, I worship the Lord. Thank you, God. When bad things happen, I run to Him in prayer. Number four, am I proclaiming, and a lot of Christians don't do this, but am I sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the lost and hurting world? You don't have to convince. You don't have to debate. All you have to do is say, man, God loves you, and he made provision for you on the cross. Jesus Christ paid for your sins. He died on your, for your sins so that you might know God. You know, just the simple gospel. Am I pressing into the Lord? And that's based on the verse, draw near to God, and what's the promise? How does that end? He will draw near to you. If you feel distant from the Lord, I can bet you're not really pressing into the Lord. Draw near to God. Oh, and he'll draw near to you. Uh, Number six, am I pursuing godly things? You know, that's all about seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? Man, all your needs are going to be met. All these things are going to be met. And number seven, I added, am I permeated with God's word? (laughs) Uh, Okay, I had to come up with a P word, and I'm like, P, P. Am I uh, uh, I, uh, perusing God's word? No, that's what most Christians do. I want to be more than perusing. I want to be permeated, permeated, thank you, with God's word. (laughs) Man, yes, his word is a lamp unto our feet, right? and a light unto our path. Man, if you need counsel, if you need direction, run to the Word of God. It is our sole source of faith and practice. We need to be permeated with the Word of God, washed with the Word of God. So Jeremiah 17, 7, these are the two theme verses God gave us for this year, 2015. And I just wanted to remind ourselves of this. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. 
For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in the year of drought nor cease to bear fruit. I don't know about you, but I love that picture of this tree that's going to stand no matter what comes its way. You know, with Christ in your heart, you can stand any trial that comes your way. Do you know that? In fact, Pastor Chris just reminded us we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, and 58 are the other two verses. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Those, that uh, exhortation we have from Paul in the days ahead, I can assure you, we're going to need, need to be a people that are being steadfast, that are immovable, that are abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that everything you do is not in vain for the Lord. You know, the Bible says that God says, my word will not what? Return void. Yeah. Hey, man, preach the word of God all you can. So before we continue our discussion on... Uh, Calvinism versus Arminianism based on our text. Let's go to our text. Currently, we're going through the book of Exodus, if you're visiting this morning. And we made it to chapter 4, verse 27. Exodus, chapter 4, verse 27. Now the Lord said to Aaron, Go to meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord, which he had sent him, and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people. Notice this in verse 31. So the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that they had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshiped. What did it take for Israel in this circumstance to believe that God was on their side? Signs and wonders, right? Okay, so Aaron spoke for Moses. Remember, Moses argued with God a few weeks ago when we were in that text. He said, man, you got the wrong guy. God said, I'm going to speak through you. I'm going to do all these great things. I'm going to deliver my people from slavery through you, Moses. And Moses said, you got the wrong guy. Choose someone else. Remember, God got mad at Moses. (laughs) The first time in the Bible that God got mad. When you think about that, through all the book of Genesis, he never got mad. Oh, he was grieved. Man, even when All of the thoughts and intents of man's heart were continually evil before he destroyed the world in Noah's flood. Never does the Bible say God was mad at them for doing that. He was grieved. Oh, he was grieved to his core. But this is the first time. Moses, after all God revealed to him, I don't know about you, but if God appeared to me like he did to Moses and said, hey, go set my people free. I'm going to go set his people free. <laughs> you know, it's like, they're, oh, yeah, God appeared to me. But Moses said, no, 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 you got the wrong guy. He gave five excuses not to. So God got mad at Moses, and we know that he even sought to kill him in, uh, in, in, in earlier in chapter 4 of Exodus, which is kind of bizarre, right? So today we find that the people finally believed that God was with them, and they bowed low and worshipped. Do you know that many people believe because you have the courage to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Turn, if you would, quickly to Romans chapter 10, starting at verse 8. You know, how do we get faith? Is it somehow supernaturally just infused to the chosen and the elect and everybody else is out of luck? And they will burn in hell because they have no free will? That's what we're going to address today. Or do we get faith by hearing the word of God? Romans chapter 10, starting at verse 8, it's very clear. For what does it, uh, but what does it say? 
The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the, with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. Note this. And with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. You know, Paul in Romans, it seems to be such a dichotomous book. On certain portions in, in the book of Romans, it's based on our choice and what we do. And the rest of the book, the other half, it's totally based on God's choice and what he does. Do you think both are important? Continue on here. Notice this. For the scripture says, verse 11, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed for there is no distinction between jew and greek for the same lord is lord of all abounding in riches for all who call on him you, you think that's anybody anybody who will continue on verse 14 how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed and how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard and how will they hear without a preacher how will they preach unless they are sent just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith, and this is important, comes through hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You see, I believe it is imperative we are out proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family, to everybody that will give us an ear. We need to be talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Because how will they believe if they don't hear? Fact of the matter is, the Bible is clear. They cannot. They need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in our uh, series in Exodus, we began this little rabbit trail on Calvinism versus Arminianism because we read in our text earlier in Exodus chapter 4 that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We discovered that literally what that meant is to solidify an already held position. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God simply solidified that hardness of heart. We covered Romans chapter 9. We went through so much, but today we need to continue. Just a reminder of the tulip. This is what Calvinism believes. Total depravity, that's the T. Everyone is born totally depraved and reprobate with the inability to seek or even choose good or God. The U, unconditional election. God could have chose to save everyone, but decided in his sovereign plan to only choose a few and the rest will burn in hell. Limited atonement. Jesus did not pay for all mankind's sins on the cross of Calvary. I don't know about you, but that is so heretical, it makes my skin crawl. Irresistible grace. You have no free will. If God chose you, if you're the elect, you will be made to choose him. If he didn't chose you, there's no way you can choose him because you are so wretched and reprobate. I don't know about you, but I find all of this offensive to the character of God. It is offensive to the nature of who God is because God is love and mercy. Oh, he's filled with grace. His mercies are new every morning. Perseverance of the saints. I'm a one-point Calvinist, I guess, because I believe once you're a child of God, wow, nothing can separate you. Oh, yeah, you might take a hiatus from the narrow path. You might go your own way, but God is, first of all, by his love and grace, is going to woo you back to repentance. Oh, you old saints of God, you've probably experienced that. You know, you're, you're sinning, you're going crazy, and yet blessings are still coming. And God's just tapping you on the shoulder. I love you, my son, my daughter. <laughs> Come back. But eventually in Hebrews, we're told that God disciplines those he loves. And if you continue off the path that God has for you, eventually the hand of discipline will come and you will come to repentance. I believe once you are a child of God, you are going to go to heaven. Come hell or high water, God's going to see to it. So do not let the enemy bring condemnation to you. Remember Romans chapter 8. Now therefore there is what? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. So the question is, is it salvation by fate 
or is it salvation by faith? These are two different Gospels, folks. Make no mistake about it. And I believe it is important that we understand who God is and soteriology, which is really salvation. It's the study of how and why we are saved. Fate's the idea that you have no free will, no choice, no belief, no will at all. In fact, God's sovereign plan is so sovereign that everything you do was already planned out by God. You have no choice in the matter. And there's no way you can choose good. Remember, my definition of faith is not a blind leap. Uh, that was actually started by a philosopher, not by the Bible. In fact, the Bible in Hebrew says faith is the evidence of things not seen. Guess what evidence is? Proof. So faith is belief plus proof. You can have solid faith. That's why the Bible says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Well, why is that? Well, because if you have faith, you have belief, and you have a little bit of that proof, you know that God is real. There's no doubt. There's no question. You know that God loves you. So the logical argument, Dr. Norman Geisler, you ever hear this guy? Uh, he gave a logical argument against Calvinism, and he said this. Not only are evil moral actions ones that could have been done otherwise, but they should have been otherwise. Here, too, logic seems to insist that such moral obligations imply that we have self-determining moral free choice. Don't worry, I'm going to get to the crux of what he's saying here. It sounds kind of confusing right now. I'm reading it, and I'm like, why did I put that whole quote in there? <laughs> okay. All right. For ought implies can. And what he means by that, that is, what we ought to do implies that we can do. Otherwise, we have to assume that the moral lawgiver is irrational, commanding that we do what is literally impossible for us to do. Good reason appears to insist that if God commands it, then we can do it. Moral obligation implies moral freedom. That's from the book Chosen But Free. And I got to tell you, folks, God has given us the ability to choose right, to choose good, to choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, even when we're born and as we grow up. Free will involves choice. Choice means that we understand the consequences of the decisions we make. Does that make sense? Okay. Thus, before we understand the consequences, we aren't held accountable. Now, some of you are thinking, hmm, are you sure about that? Let's see what the Bible says. Romans 5.13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But note this, sin is not imputed where there is no law. Sin literally means in the Greek, what does it mean? To miss the mark. The idea is that clock is a bullseye, and if I had a bow and arrow up here, if I shoot for the center of that clock and I miss it, even a little bit, guess what? I sinned. I missed the mark. Well, you have to know how to shoot, and you have to know where the bullseye is before you can miss the mark. So what I'm talking about really is the age of accountability. The question is, do babies that die go to heaven? Are we born such sinful reprobates deserving God's wrath that before someone comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they will burn in hell because they're reprobate? That's the question. Or are we innocent until we begin to practice sin? What does the Bible say? What think you about it? Let's see what it says. If babies are born reprobate, they will go to hell. Make no mistake about it. However, we established in the past two sessions of this, actually three, that they are not born reprobate, and we must remember this verse, where, uh, that sin is not imputed where there is no law. If they don't know the law, then the sin of Adam ev isn't even imputed to them. So what did we inherit from Adam? We went over all the verses, death. And through sin, death, but through his sin, death came into the world. So Calvinists have three general responses to do babies go to heaven the first one is some babies do because they are elect the rest will burn in hell okay that's one way they answer the question the second is this since we have inherited sin from adam all babies will burn in hell and the third answer is this god chose partiality to babies born to elect couples 
So they may go to heaven. Babies born to sinners will burn in hell. So what we've already established, Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awesome God who does what? Not show partiality or take a bribe. Acts 10, 34, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. What is partiality? Well, Romans 2, 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So the definition of partiality, literally in the Greek, it means unfair, biased in favor of one thing or person compared with another. Favoritism, a respecting of persons, partiality, favoritism to choose one above another. So let me ask you a question. Do you think God chooses a few people to go to heaven in his sovereign will and everyone else will burn in hell? That is the premise of Calvinism. God does not choose one above the other. There's no partiality with God. John 3, 16, for whosoever believes will be saved. So the idea is we are born with the ability to sin, but we are not dead until we sin. Turn to Romans chapter 5, and I'll establish that, starting at verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. What is it saying right there? Hey, all of Adam's uh, descendants didn't sin in the likeness of Adam. Remember, sin is not imputed where what? He just said it. There is no law. Continue on who is in the type of him who is to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift of grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. I think that's pretty clear. We're born with the ability to sin. And when you sin, guess what? You die, right? It's very clear. Continue. Yeah, the way to sin is death. Much more than those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then, as though through one transgression there resulted condemnation to who? All men. Even so, through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to who? All men. So a Calvinist would say, you know, we we are all born sinners, all of us, through Adam. But in this very verse that they used to establish that, they would have to say everyone is saved as well. It's literally called universalism because it says just like through Adam, death came, all, all were condemned. Through Christ, justification came. And it literally says all men were justified. So the idea is that death doesn't come until you sin, just like salvation doesn't come until you receive Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So it is based on the choice that you make. God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. Do you know that? That's the will of God this morning, that everyone, man, woman, and child, come to repentance and be saved. In fact, he chose everybody think about it if i said today after church i wanted to take you all to uh, the food court and buy you all lunch right if i said that i'm choosing all of you to go to lunch with me i love you i i want you to come to lunch with me 
but only three of you came. Could I tell those three, you didn't choose me, but I chose you? Yes, I could. Because I chose, I chose you first. Oh, just because you accepted the free gift, now you're coming, but I can clearly say, you did not choose me, I chose you. Does that make sense? So God chooses everyone. He's not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. Continue on. God reveals himself to everyone, and they have to choose to reject him to be turned over to sin or a reprobate mind, meaning they were not born with it. Where do we get that from? Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a reprobate or depraved mind to do the things which are not proper. Folks, that simply means they were not born reprobate. They had to be turned over to a reprobate mind. In fact, Romans 1, uh, starting in verse 16, we don't have time to read it. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Is it already that late? <laughs> oh, no. Yes, and that's how he hardened his heart. So total depravity and ability also seems to oppose the biblical teaching of someone hardening their heart. So the scripture warns us that those who repeatedly practice sin will sear their conscience, right? Meaning their conscience isn't seared when they're born. Does that make sense? 1 Timothy 4.2 says they will render their heart calloused before God if they continue to practice sin and harden their heart towards God and his truth. This is not a condition of birth, folks, but it's a consequence of repeated sin. So the whole idea, and it is very clear, do babies go to heaven? Absolutely. So what does that mean? Everybody is written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, the minute they're conceived. Now think about that for a minute. Do we have proof of that? Oh, yes, we do. Let's look at it really quick, and we got to go fast. So write these, down, these verses down. <laughs> the moment you're conceived, your name is written in the book of life. Psalm 69, 27. Add iniquity to their iniquity, and may they not come to your righteousness. May they be blotted out of the book of life. David is writing this about a pagan nation. Meaning their name is written in the book of life. May their name be blotted out. Are you with me? Okay. All right, continue on. Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Meaning these people, there are people that will be erased. Everyone's name is written in the book of life. Exodus 32, 31, and this makes it really clear. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a God of gold for themselves. But now if you, you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out of the book which you have written. And God said, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Meaning before the age of accountability, before a child can choose right or wrong, that sin of Adam, we read it in Romans, is not imputed to them. Their name is written in the book of life. Folks, if they die, they do go to heaven. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Because God is a merciful and just and loving God. Quick review. So when someone is born, they are born with God's law written on their heart. Romans chapter 2, remember that? Those pagans that do instinctively the things of the law show the law written on their heart and their conscience rather judge them good or bad when Christ judges their works on the final day, the last judgment. All right. Sin is not imputed to those who do not know the law. The good news of the gospel, it's all about receiving God's grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, everybody will be judged by their works, except who? Christians. We're judged by our faith. Christ paid for all of that on the cross of Calvary. But the white throne judgment, there is going to be sheep and goats. And these, this group is judged by works, not faith. We're not a part of that judgment. We're the beam of seed of Christ's judgment. So Romans 5.13, we already read it. Christ, 
question. Yep. Hey, Joe, come on up. Let's get ready to close in worship because we have prayer today. So I'm ending a little early uh, so we can do our corporate prayer. First John chapter two, verse one says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an attorney. Don't you like that? We have an advocate. Literally, it's legal terms. It's an attorney. It's one who defends with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Folks, every day we have choices to make. We need to choose right. We need to choose life. We need to choose to be pleasing to God. Amen? I pray that all of us would really be about that and start choosing life. Comforts me, strengthens and restores my soul, satisfies my need. Thank you for listening to Staying the Course with Pastor Brett Peterson. If you would like a copy of this message or would like to submit a prayer request or comment, Contact us at 949-888-5777 or email us at info at ccbcu.edu. God bless you as you seek and serve Him. Remember, stay the course and we'll see you next week.